will come against the powers of hell. Let my faithful servants rejoice in my protection, for I take great delight in my people, and I crown their faithfulness with victory. I will honor your praises as they rise to me. I have placed my two-edged sword in your hands so that you can inflict my vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with fetters, their nobles with shackles of iron, to carry out the sentence written against them. See now that there is no God besides me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal, and no one can deliver out of my hand. As surely as I live forever, when I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand grasps it in judgment, I will take vengeance on the adversaries and repay those who hate me. We release the sword of the Lord against the powers of hell in the name of Yeshua. Send your angels with flaming swords to fight our battles in the heavens. Let your enemies fall by the sword. Take vengeance on our adversaries and rise up to stand victoriously over all of Satan's demon warriors. Amen. My arrows of light will not destroy the kingdom of darkness. I have promised that I will send out my arrows and scatter the enemy. Do not fear the kingdom of darkness, for I will protect you. Through my unfailing love, you will not be shaken. When the enemy appears before you for battle, I will burn them up as in a, fla as in a blazing furnace. My fire will consume them. Though they plot evil against you and devise wicked schemes, they cannot succeed. My arrows will flash like lightning, and I will destroy them. My sharp arrows will pierce their hearts. I am a righteous judge. I will display my wrath against the kingdom of darkness every day. I will sharpen my sword and will bend and, and string my bow. I have prepared my deadly weapons and have made ready my flaming arrows. We release the arrow of the Lord's deliverance in our lives. Ordain and release your arrows against our persecutors. Send your arrows and scatter the enemy. Let your arrow go forth as lightning against the enemy. Break their bones and pierce them through with your arrows. Amen. Shabbat shalom. This is Lena from St. Petersburg. Portion su I'll be reading uh, portion summary and this week in Bible history. The 17th reading from the Torah is named Yithro, which is the literal Hebrew behind the name Jethro. The title comes from the first words of the first verse of the reading, which says, Now Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people. Exodus chapter 18, verse 1. The portion tells the story of Jethro's visit to the camp of Israel, then relates the great theophany at Mount Sinai, where God gives Israel the Ten Commandments and invites the people to enter a special covenant relationship with him. Asher born, <coughs> excuse me, Shevet 20, 1562 BCE. Asher, the son of Jacob, was born on the 20th of Shevet of the year 2199 from creation, 1562 BCE. According to some accounts, this is also the date of his passing. <coughs> War on Benjamin, Shevet 23, circa 1228 BCE. Armies of the tribe of Israel converged upon the tribe of Benjamin in the aftermath of the concubine at Giva incident in a war which nearly brought about the extension of the Benjamites, as related in the book of Judges, chapter 19, verse 2, or chapter 19 to 2. The event occurred during the judgeship of Othniel ben Nitz, who led the people of Israel in the years 2533 to 2573 from creation, 1228 to 1188 BCE. Zechariah's prophecy, uh, Shevet 24, 351 BCE. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shevet, in the second year of the reign of Darius, the word of God came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido, the prophet, saying, I will return to Jerusalem in mercy. My house will be built within her, and, I, and the Lord shall console Zion and shall, you, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. 
Zechariah chapter 1, verses 7 through chapter 2, 17. This was two years before the completion of the second temple on the 3rd of Adar, 3412, 349 BCE. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. <clears throat> Excuse me, all praises to Yahweh. Okay, Yeshua, man of war, lion of Judah. Exodus 14, 13 through 14. Moses said to the people, <clears throat> don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall never see them again. Hey, hey Moses, pro he prophesied. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yahweh will fight for you, and you shall be still. The Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua, with the emphasis on the last syllable. The Messiah's name is Yeshua, with the emphasis on the you, which is pronounced U, as in the word soon. The name Yeshua is a shortened form of the name Yehoshua. Compare with Numbers 13 and 16, with Nehemiah 8 and 17, and with Haggai 1 and 1, and with Ezra 5 and 2. And you can see also in Numbers 13 and 16, where uh, it uses the name uh, Joshua or, or Yeshua. And also <clears throat> in Ezra uh, 5 and 2, they change it and use Jeshua with the J-E. Now, Moses knew something that the word is not telling us. Because in Numbers 13 and 16, you notice he changed the name to Hoshea. That, that was the son of Nun. He changed the name from Yo Yo Hoshea, which means desire for salvation. And he changed his name to Joshua which meaning the Lord is salvation. So Moses knew something, and he knew something about the name. He had to know something about that name and Christ coming as the Lord of salvation. Now, the Greek word Jesus has no meaning in the Greek language. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, oh <laughs> So, either you know, people always go back and forth over the names. His name is this. His name is that. Oh, you, you calling this name, that's the wrong God. And, and so we have to get over that because Jesus even means nothing in the Greek name. And, and, and the Lord already know. He told us, look, he already knew we was going to be down here arguing over something simple. So that's why, that's why Yeshua said, that's why Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. You know, so you could call whatever name you can come up with, but if you don't know that voice and not following these laws, statutes, and commandments, no matter who you call on. Okay. The name Jesus is an attempt to transliterate Yeshua into Greek. In the Septuagint, you can find the name Jesus as a transliteration of the names Yehoshua or Joshua and Yeshua, Jeshua. See the Septuagint. Now, Exodus 17 and 9. Oh, and, and First Chronicles 24 and 11. In the First Chronicles 24 and 11, it also mentions Jeshua with the J-E. Now, since all Greek names ended with the letter A are girl names, they traded the letter A at the end of Yeshua with the letter S and thus got a name that sounded masculine. At least they did that. <laughs> in 15 and 1, then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to Yahweh and said, I will sing to Yahweh, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. They sang to Yahweh, not to people. That is true worship. It is directed to Yahweh, and its purpose is to please him and not men. The word sing is written in the future tense, will sing. Rashi says that when a word is written this way, it can be understood in three ways. Something that one has determined in one's heart, but does not necessarily fulfill. Compare with Numbers 21 and 17, Joshua 10 and 12, and 1 Kings 7 and 8, and 11 and 7. Now, we know Yahweh had angels that was, that was created to worship him. 
and to sing praises to him. So he, he, he loves being praised. He wants to be the head of our life continuously. That's why he created us that way. Cause you notice when you're happy and you're feeling joy, you're just walking around the house hmm, 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 and you're singing and you're cleaning and you're singing and, and because of the joy in your heart. So that's giving Yahweh praise. And that's what he wants us to do when he deliver us, when we wake up, when we think about just his blessings. It, it don't always have to be looking for something supernatural. Just the everyday blessings that he give us is something to praise and, get, and be thankful for. Now, something that, okay, next. Something that one does all the time or something that recurs. You can see Numbers 9 and 20 and Job 1 and 5. And something that one would do in the future. This is what the Jewish wise men have used to prove that a resurrection can be traced, can be found in the Torah. In this case, we can rule out option two. Since they only sang once by the sea, it is interesting to note that the Torah speaks about the song of Moses being sung in connection with the final redemption and resurrection, resurrection of the dead, as it is written in Revelations 15, 2, and 2 through 4. I saw something like a sea of glass mixture with fire and those who overcame the beast, his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the lamb saying, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, you king of the nations. Who wouldn't fear you, Lord, and glorify your name? For you only are consecrated. For all the nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. This is the God that we serve. The song of Moses and of the Lamb is the song of the final redemption. In the same way that the children of Israel came up out of the sea, which represents the resurrection. All those who have put their trust in the Messiah of Israel are going to be redeemed from death. Then they can sing this song to Yahweh on the other side. Okay, the song in Shemot in Exodus chapter 15 teaches us the importance of expressing ourselves before Yahweh with song, dance, and instruments. It is a part of our dedication to him. And that's one thing that uh, Grace and Miriam do every Shabbat. We sing and we dance and, and give him praise. It is a part of our dedication to him. It is also a way of standing on fire in our spirits. This song has three main themes. The greatness of the Yahweh, the deliverance from the Egyptians, the future entrance into the promised land with reference to the messianic kingdom. So we have so much to look forward to. So we praise in God for his greatness, for his deliverance, for the things that he delivered us from, and for the future events that, that he, that's going to take place for us. Every area of our life. Now, Yahweh is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Hebrew word that is translated, I will praise him, is ve'anvihu, which means I will make him lovely. It comes from the root nava, which means prepare a place. This teaches us that our service and obedience to the Yahweh ought to be done in a beautiful way. This is why it is a custom to make beautiful taliots, teflon, mezuits, Torah scrolls, sukkot, Sabbath cups, and other objects that are used to fulfill the commandments. We also learn that our songs of worship prepare a place for Yahweh to dwell among us. So they let us know everything that we do for Yahweh, we have to do to the best of our ability. Because, you know, he, he don't want halfway this or halfway that. He wants our entire everything when we're dealing with him. Now, we also learned that our songs of worship prepare a place for Yahweh to dwell among us, as it is written in Psalms 22 and 3. But you are consecrated, you who inhabit the praises of Israel. Now, the word inhabit comes from the word yashad, meaning sit, which has to do with settling somewhere and taking up one's throne. Yahweh settles and is enthroned on the praises of Israel. That also means that he shows his might, his rule, and his power through the praises of Israel. See Exodus 15 and 13. Now, Exodus 15 and 3, Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. There are many texts in scriptures where Yahweh is revealed as a man of war. See Isaiah 42, 13 through 15, 
and 51 and 22, Zephaniah 3 and 17, and Nehemiah 4 and 20. He is not peacefully inclined towards unrighteousness and evil. Anyone who does not fight sin and unrighteousness in his environment is not following the example of his heavenly father. The indifference of the righteous in the face of evil in this world is what allows evil to spread and work without fear. If we are silent in the face of evil, we are implicated in the guilt of that evil. Man, we can't be on both sides. Now, Exodus 15 and 6. Your right hand, Yahweh, is glorious in power. Your right hand, Yahweh, dashes the enemy in pieces. The right hand of Yahweh is the Messiah. He is the one who will finally destroy those enemies who will rise up against people of Israel, according to Isaiah 63, 1 through 6, where it is written, He who, who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? Now, this Edom is represents a God-hating world. It's a comparison. So, who is who who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? This who is glorious in his clothing, marching in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why are you red in your clothing and your garments like him who treads in the wine vat? I have trotting the wine press alone. And of the peoples, there was no man with me. Yes, I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I have stained all my clothing, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of my redeem is come. I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation to me, and my wrath, it upheld me. I trod down the peoples in my anger, and I made them drunk in my wrath and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. That's going to be a day not to play with. <laughs> yeah. So he's, he's saying that he had vengeance in his heart. So he's ready to come and redeem his people. So he's letting them know, y'all just got to hold on, hang in there, keep the commandments. He's coming. <laughs> he's coming for us. So who is this passage speaking about? Revelations 19, 11 through 16 give us the answer. I saw the heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has names written, and a name written which no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a garment sprinkled with blood. His name is called the Word of God. The armies which are in heaven followed him on white horses, clothed in white, pure, fine linen. Out of his mouth proceeds a sharp, double-edged sword, that with it he shall strike the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty. He has on his garment and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Coming to show him who's boss. Now, Messiah Yeshua carries out the wrath of Yahweh. The first time he came, he came as God's lamb, but at the second coming, he would come as the lion of Judah. Shabbat shalom. Before Ed comes. All right. On the uh, second page where we talk about the Greek word Jesus. Okay. Number one, we need to understand that the letter J did not become a consonant sound until about the late 1500s, early 1600s. Okay, so it is impossible for anyone during the days that he walked the earth to call him Jesus. Okay, number two, when we first came into Torah, you remember how we vilified the name Jesus. It is the name of a pagan god and all this kind of stuff which always sounded very ignorant to me when you took the language and tried to transliterate from uh, Hebrew to Greek. There was no way you could do it because there were certain consonant sounds that were not in Greek. So if you did a match for match, and I remember sitting in my floor doing it, you came up with the name Jesus. There was just no way around, okay, around that. 
All right. So all of that about being pagan names and all that kind of stuff usually is people who don't know, okay, the languages. Um, let me see here. Uh, another thing with this on the last page. All right. I have always said that paragraph about Revelation 19 verses 11 through 16, that I fully believe that John had the revelation before he wrote the book of John and also uh, the epistles of John also. And the reason for that is that the book of John is written from the aspect that Yeshua is Yahweh, all right? And so to know that, he would have had to have the revelation first. And this kind of explains it, where it says in here, his name is called the Word of God. Because how does John open up the book of John? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, so you see, you know, I, I believe he had that revelation and then he was able to write those, the books and the epistles, okay, uh, of that. You know, but this also lets you know, just like uh, uh, Leroy was saying, people go to war over the name. I mean, oh my gosh, I cannot tell you how many times I had to crawl out of the depths of hell from being cast in there about the <laughs> mispronunciation of the name. And most times, uh, let me tell you this, this can be kind of embarrassing. When people try to get into debates with Hebrew scholars who are, he who are scholars over the language, mm -hmm. it's kind of ridiculous for someone to try to come against someone who this is their language. You understand what I'm saying? You know, and you just learned something you know, five minutes ago, and now you're ready to go teach scholars all of that. And let me tell you something. Here's here's the whole thing. People who are usually the scholars go into bobblehead mode with that. They're not going to they're not going to dispute because you know the reason they don't dispute is not because you're right. Is because what does Proverbs say? Okay, if you argue with a fool, you a fool yourself. Okay, so if I don't know, I'll be the first one to say, okay, that I, I don't know something instead of being arrogant about it because that doesn't give you a chance to learn, okay, with that. So that was one of the things. And I remember when I uh, was first coming into this and um, this was in, I would say really coming into it, 2001 is when I went over to England. All right, so when we were, you know, talking about how the letter J was not a consonant sound, okay, until it was probably more the mid-1600s. When you say the mid-1600s, what should come to your mind right away? First thing that came to my mind was the fact that when was the King James Version written? 1611. 1611. So therefore, the letter J was a consonant sound years after the first publication of the original 1611. And in fact, we have a copy here uh, uh, of the uh, 1611. So when I was in England, I went to all of the museums looking at the original Bibles, even before the 1611, looking for that name. I mean, looking for what name they, they had in there. And there were no J's. OK, in fact, it was I-E-O-U-S-U-S, -S, something like that in the Latin, because remember, it was a transliteration, not directly from necessarily the uh, Hebrew into the Greek, but you had to go through Latin and all of that in order to get to that name. OK, like that. And so you will not find that letter J as a consonant sound, OK, in the King James Version. All right. And that's how I would approach people when they would argue, especially Christians, you know, argue about the name is Jesus. I just simply used to carry around a copy of the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica or even the, no, the Webster's Di Dictionary. OK, that had, a, you know, the section on letter J. All right. And the uh, etymology of how that, you know, came about to being. Because, you know, manage by facts. You don't have to argue with anyone here. Read it for yourself. You know, this was not a religious, the Encyclopedia Britannica is not a religious book. They just hear with the facts. <laughs> okay. 
And so when you manage with the facts, all right, now let me give you a little hint. Okay. Remember how we talked about the different levels of deception, how you can be deceived by man, how you can be self-deceived, and how you can be deceived by God. This is a little test I use, okay, a lot of times about that and the name. So when you insist upon certain things and I show you this is the truth and that his name, once again, just what we went over, that Yeshua is a shortened form of the word Yahashua. As a matter of fact, okay, you know that from Acts chapter 7 where they made a mistake. Go to Acts chapter 7 for a minute. Okay, what Bible am I in here? Let me show you this. Acts chapter 7 is where uh, Stephen is giving his dissertation, which, of course, they took him out and stoned him for afterwards, <laughs> which is usually what you, they do to you when you're telling the truth that, that people don't want to hear. We talked about that the other day. There is truth people just don't want to hear. Okay. In Acts chapter 7, hold on here. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, hold on. I can't find it here. All right. In Acts chapter 7, uh, Stephen is giving them the history, all right, uh, uh, of the church here. Hold on here. Eight and a half, and let's go over towards the end. Oh, God, you know I can't find it now. That aggravates me. Ah, okay, uh, verse number 45. All right, so... Two things to note about Acts chapter 7. It talks about the beginning of the church, all right? In verse number 38, it says, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. So what was the original, okay, founding of the church? Not Acts chapter 2, but in the book of Exodus, okay? Our Torah portion tells you, okay, this is the origin of the church right there. So that is kind of, and I, when I point this out to people, I say, uh, excuse me, but what book is Acts in again? That's New Testament. So the New Testament, okay, is telling you the church began where? In the wilderness around Sinai, okay? Then when you go to verse number 45, this is great. Verse 45 says, okay, remember, Stephen is given the history of the, of the church and everything. So he goes, which also our fathers that came after th brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles. Uh-uh. Joshua is the one that went into the, led them into the promised land. So because they translated this as Jesus, okay, what should they have translated it as? Joshua which means Jesus is what? A transliteration, really, of Joshua. Joshua is a transliteration of Yahashua, but the actual word for Jesus should have been Joshua. But why wasn't it Joshua? Why didn't they do Joshua? The reason is because, remember, by then they had rejected the Hebrew roots, and Joshua or Yahashua just sounded a little bit too Hebrew. You understand what I'm saying? Because you're not going to keep the Hebrew names and then go with a Greek doctrine. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, with that. So this is good right here. When people say that there are mistakes in the Bible, that was deliberate. That was not a mistake. That was deliberate. But see, if you don't know Torah, sometimes you don't even question. Why did they put that in there? It wasn't, okay, it was not Jesus that led them over. It was Joshua. Oh, this should have been translated. Jesus should be translated in the Bible as Joshua. If you're going to anglicize it, the anglicized name for Jesus is Joshua. So when you said, okay, uh, according to that, that Jesus has no meaning in the Greek, it doesn't. It doesn't. 
okay? It has meaning in the Hebrew, all right? So I'm off my soapbox now. Go ahead, Ed. <laughs> Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Following up on the theme of he's coming, here comes the bride. Nope, here comes the groom. Exodus 9, 17. Moses led the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the lower part of the mountain. At this point, the people could come out of their tents to meet God. According to Deuteronomy 33, 2, the Yahweh also came out to meet the people as it is written. He said, Yahweh came from Sinai rose from Seir to them, he shined forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of the consecrated one. At his right hand was a fiery law, a Torah for them. Here it does not say that Yahweh came to Sinai, but from Sinai. This teaches us that not only did he come down to Sinai, but he also left the mountain to go and meet the people. The Hebrew wedding tradition is intimately connected with this occasion when Israel entered the covenant and received the Torah. Israel is the bride. Yahweh is the bridegroom. Once again, Israel is the bride. Yes, men, we're part of Israel. We're part of the bride. Yahweh is the bridegroom. Moses is the friend of the bridegroom. The angels are witnesses. The thick clouds, that's the hoopah or the wedding canopy. The woman was redeemed from her slavery in order to be married. The man gives her the wedding proposal through his friend, the mediator. The woman accepts the proposal willingly, and the friend goes with her answer to the man. The woman goes to a tebala, or a ritual bath, in order to enter a new level. The great day is announced with a shofar blast. The bridegroom leaves his place to go and meet the bride. The bride leaves her house and goes to meet the bridegroom. This is the way they enter the first stage of a Hebrew marriage covenant. It is called Kedeshim or consecration. It is at this point that they are both set themselves apart for each other and tie themselves to each other. Therefore, this act is also called erosin, from the verb aris or bind. A marriage contract is handed to the bride. It is called a ketubah or a writing. That is where all the conditions of the marriage covenant are written. Before we proceed, let us go over these terms once more. Number one, we have tupa which is a wedding canopy. In this case, it was a cloud. Number two, we have tevela, which is a ritual uh, purification or bath. The tevela is the first part. It is a full bath immersion. There's also another term called hetilat yadayim. That is a hand washing. So you can have a full bath immersion, a tevela, or a hand washing, which is a hetat yadayim. The third term we heard was kedeshin, that is consecration or dedication. The fourth term was erisin or betrothal. And the fifth term we have was the katuba or the writing or a marriage contract signed by two witnesses. So once again, we have those terms explaining that the Hebrew wedding takes place in two phases. The erisin is the betrothal of the ceremony. There are two blessings, one over the cup of wine, the second blessing is over the bride and groom, and then the bride and groom drink from that cup. When the bride and groom reach the hoopah, or the marriage canopy, that is when the erison of that ceremony begins. So it's first important to note that there's an engagement phase in a Hebrew wedding, and then the final ceremony that takes place later. Um, reading further, in Deuteronomy uh, 20 and 7, we see that there's a time between the first stage of the marriage itself and the wedding. In Deuteronomy 22, 23, and 24, we see that it is after the first step of the marriage covenant is taken, the woman is called another man's wife, in effect a wife. Reading from Deuteronomy 20 and 7, where we have a topic discussion of how to wage war. Deuteronomy 20 and 7, And what man is there that hath betrothed a wife and hath not taken her? Is there anyone who hath paid the bride price, that's the betrothal part, has paid the bride price for a wife, but who has not yet married her, let him go and return into his house, lest he die in battle and another man take her. So the first phase is to pay the bride price. That's Deuteronomy 20 and 7. In ancient days, there could be as much as 12 months between the first and the second step. Today, normally both steps are taken in the same day. After the first step of Kiddushin, the bride goes home to her father's house and prepares her wedding gown and other things. 
the bridegroom goes to his father's house and prepares a dwelling place for them. In my father's house are what? Many mansions. When the bridegroom's father sees that both are ready, he is announces it this with a blast of the shofar and gives his son permission to go and fetch his bride. So when Yeshua is talking about no man knows but the father knows, he's alluding to that ceremony, which we didn't know what he was talking about at the time. The son then goes to the home of the bride's parents and lifts her up in the air and takes her into his father's house, where the second step in the marriage covenant is going to be taken. This is called lakak, or to take. See Genesis 24 and 3, and Nesuin from Nassai, a lift up. See 2 Chronicles 24, 3. Genesis 24, 3. And I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, the God of earth, that you will not take lakak, a wife for my son, from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. That is, of course, of Abraham giving instructions to his uh, servant to go find a wife for Isaac. Second Chronicles 24, 3. And Yohara took for himself two wives, a Nasa. He took or he lifted up two wives and he begat sons and daughters. So once again, we have those two terms of Lakak to take and Nesuin to lift up. The people of Israel are presented in scriptures in, in I'm sorry, in different ways in the scripture in reference to their relationship to Yahweh. Sometimes Israel is called a son, as Exodus 4.22. Sometimes it is called a virgin daughter, Jeremiah 14.17. Sometimes it is presented as a wife who has gone through both marriage steps and has children, Ezekiel 16, also Hosea 1-3. In Jeremiah 2.2, 2, it is written, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Yahweh, I remember you for the kindness of your youth the love of your wedding, how you went after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. Those who have entered the first stage of the marriage covenant can be called both husband and wife and bridegroom and bride. They already have a wedding covenant, but it has not yet been sealed. It is not right to have marriage relations until the second step has taken place. If someone is unfaithful during their betrothal, they are guilty of the penalty of death. Witness Mary and Joseph, Mary being found pregnant during the first phase. So Mary, by law, was guilty of the penalty of death. See Deuteronomy 22, 23 to 24. This means that when the bride Israel is unfaithful with the golden calf, a lover who came by, Yahweh had the legal right to execute her. But Moses stepped in and rescued the people. The covenant that was made after that has Moses as a guarantor, according to what is written in Exodus 34, 27. Yahweh said to Moses, write you these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. This meant that the relationship between Israel and Yahweh was never the same again. The marriage could not be completed because of the sin of the golden calf. The covenant need to be renewed. As it is written in Jeremiah 31, 32, where it is speaking of a different covenant that the one made after the exodus from Israel. So once again, we see in Jeremiah 31, Behold, the day comes, said the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So God is making a new covenant, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke. Although I was a husband to them, says Yahweh. The breach in the marriage covenant between Israel and Yahweh occurred when Israel sinned with the golden calf. In this text, it is written that Yahweh was Israel's husband when she broke the covenant. This means, this means that they had taken the first step of the covenant, but not necessarily the second. In Hosea 21, 14 through 15 and 19 to 20, it is written, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness to speak tenderly to her. I will give her vineyards from there the valley of Achar, from the door of hope. And she will respond there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness, in justice, in loving kindness, and in compassion. I will even betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know Yahweh. Here it is speaking of a renewal of the betrothal between Yahweh and Israel. That is to say, the first stage of the marriage covenant. This was done through the Messiah Yeshua's blood. And as we said earlier, in the Shabbat of Pentecost celebration, after his resurrection, 
as they were celebrating the memory of the first betrothal covenant between Yahweh and Israel. The Spirit came over the faithful in Israel. Then the renewal of the covenant was sealed through the ketubah, the writing of the marriage contract which was written on the heart of the bride so that she could be faithful and not sin again. So the new ketubah, a covenant, is written on the heart. The first one was written in stone. In the Messianic writings, the son is presented as the bridegroom and his congregation as the bride. In Matthew 22, 2, it is written, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who made a marriage feast for his son. In 2 Corinthians 11, 2, it is written, I have espoused to you one husband that I may present you as a pure virgin to the Messiah. In Ephesians 5, 31, 32, it is written, For this cause, a man will leave his father and mother and will be joined to his wife. The two will become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I speak concerning Messiah and the assembly. In Revelations 19, 7, it is written, Let us rejoice and be exceedingly glad, and let us give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. The new covenant was made with Israel, according to Jeremiah 31, 31, not with another people. Messiah's assembly is the most elevated part of Israel, the heavenly Israel, in which also the righteous ones among the nations have been incorporated through the regeneration in the Messiah. In Hebrews 12, 12 to 24, it is written, But you have come to Mount Zion, Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable multitude of angels, to the general assembly and the assembly of the firstborn who are rolled in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the just men made perfect, to Yeshua, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood sprinkling that speaks before better than that of Abel. Yeshua did not start a new religion. If he did, he would have violated, he would become a false prophet, as we found in Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. Be careful to observe only that which I enjoin upon you, neither add to it nor take away from it. If there appears among you a prophet or a dreamer or a diviner who gives you a sign or a portent saying, let us follow or worship another God whom you've not experienced, even if the sign or portent that you name to you comes true, do not heed the word of that prophet or that dreamer. For the Lord your God is testing you to see whether you really love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul. Follow none but the Lord your God and revere none but him. Observe his commandments alone and heed only his orders to worship none but him and hold fast to him. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. So Yeshua could not come along to form a new religion. Messiah's bride is the most elevated part, the chosen one of Israel. As you can see in John 3, 26 to 29, where it is written, They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, the same immerses, and everyone is coming to him. And John answered, a man can receive nothing unless it had been given him from heaven. You yourself testified that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I've been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore is made filled. The message that the prophet is declaring to us is that the bride is part of the people of Israel. The bride, the assembly, existed already before the Messiah died, as it is written in Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives, even as the Messiah also loved the assembly and gave himself up for it. One cannot love something that does not exist. The assembly existed long before Yeshua, as we can see in Acts 7.38, where it is written, there is he who was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel that spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the living oracle to give to us. Therefore, according to the scriptures, the beginning of the church was not at the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, but at Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus, where Yahweh made the covenant of betrothal of marriage to Israel. He renews that covenant through his own blood at the cross. We who once were far off from the covenants of promise to Israel are now joined to those covenants through the blood of Yeshua. God is coming back for his bride. He has only one bride. That bride is Israel. Are you a bride? Be ready, because here comes the groom. Shabbat Shalom.
And Cindy, you can remember when I got married, all right, how uh, uh, Dr. Israel came down with trumpets, okay, announcing trumpets, okay, and all of that. This is very rich for a lot of reasons because what this actually reveals to you is why there had to be a born again experience and why Yeshua had to die and be resurrected. All right, so we all agree that Yeshua is the God of Genesis, Exodus. He's the one that is the lawgiver at Mount Sinai. He's the one that's thundering down, bringing Israel to him as a bride because the church started in the wilderness, right? I got to set that in your, your mind. So how many brides are there? So if you are not Israel, you're not a bride. Well, okay, now that you said that, I want you to think of something, okay, uh, and going back to a previous Torah portion, when uh, Reuben committed a grievous sin by going in and laying with his father's wife. Okay, I want you to start thinking about this. How many brides are there again? How many gods are there? So if Yeshua is not Yahweh, we have a problem. Because it is forbidden for a son to go into his father's bride. It's like, oh, oh, oh. Okay. Because that'll start people's heads spinning. Okay. But see, if you don't know Torah, you don't understand that. Okay, you don't understand that. So, okay, uh, um, that's another reason why there must be a born again experience. Go to Deuteronomy 24. Deuteronomy 24 sets a precedence. I'll start at verse one. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because she hath found he hath found some uncleanness in her. You think uh, adultery is uncleanness? <laughs> yeah. Then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. What do you think happened with the golden calf? That was a breaking of the marriage covenant. Okay. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be with another man. She may go and be another man's wife. What did also Israel do in the first temple when they had Baal and all that kind of stuff? So just remember what's going on here. Because uh, idolatry is a form of spiritual adultery. Okay? Now, verse 3. If the latter husband hate her, and give her a bill of divorcement. So in other words, if that next husband gives her a bill of divorcement and give it to her in her hand and sendeth her out of their house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, verse four, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled, for that is abomination before Yahweh, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which Yahweh thy Elohim giveth thee for an inheritance. Why did Yeshua have to die and become one new man? This verse right here. Why do we have to be born again? This verse right here. Because once you have the born-again experience, you are no longer the old man, but what? One new man, and now both can come back together again. Which is why Paul, okay, clarifies it. Oh, guys, in Romans chapter 11, remember, you are grafted into Israel, one bride again. 
and all Israel will be saved. One bride again. If you are not Israel, you don't have a covenant. If you are not Israel, you are not the bride. If Yeshua is not Yahweh, we got a problem. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so that's why in understanding church doctrines with the Trinity and all this kind of stuff, you got the church and you have Israel. Okay, so what do we have? One big love fest in, 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 in heaven, Yahweh with the, with the Jews and Yeshua with the church and all this craziness. We had craziness. The Bible is very clear if you know how to look for it. All right, this was very clear. Another thing, you know, coming from the United Pentecostal Church, okay, no jewelry, no nothing, no anything like that. And I always wondered why. I always wondered. Now, I always believe that if you're going to work in McDonald's, you don't wear a Burger King uniform. So if you are going to be a member of a congregation, you follow those rules. You don't buck up against them. You leave if, if, if that's the case. So no problem with that. But I always wondered, and the reason I wondered was because that was so inconsistent with what I saw in the Bible. Go for a moment to genero generosity. Uh, Genesis, <laughs> Genesis 22. Genesis 22, let's look at verse number, uh, let's see here. Did I say Genesis 22? Oh, hold on here. I'm sorry, Genesis 24. Verse number 22. All right, so we know this is Eliezer, right? Eliezer uh, going to find a wife for um, Isaac. Verse 22. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold. All right, go over to verse number 53. After Eliezer goes back, okay, and sees uh, Laban, the family, and all that kind of stuff, and Rebecca agrees to come, there's the bride price, right? Okay. But there are also gifts for the bride. Let me tell you, that's important. You want to know why? Because also in First in First Corinthians, it talks about, and he gave gifts unto man. All right? So there is a gifting that goes on here, verse 53. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebecca. So how come... When the groom is pleased with the bride and his choice, he gives her jewelry to wear. All right, so in the back of my mind. All right, turn over to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. Let's start at verse number nine. All right. Um, actually, verse number eight. Now, when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith Adonai Yahweh, and thou became mine. Then washed I thee with water, yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger skin, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands, and a chain on thy neck, and I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thy ears, and a beautiful crown upon thy head. Thus thou wast decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was a fine linen and silk, broidered work, thou did eat fine flour, and blah, blah, blah. So this is the bribe that God is saying, I decked you out. I decked you out, girl. Okay. Now, of course, we know what she did with all of that. 
But I want you to think about it, okay? When Israel came out of Egypt, what did they come out with? Gold, jewels, all of that, okay? And raiment and everything. So I'm trying to ponder this, ponder this, okay? Struggle, kind of struggling with this because I know what the word says. And my problem, okay, was that people would try to cast women into hell for wearing jewelry. You're a sinner, you're this, you're backslidden, you're all of this stuff. And that did not ring to me. If that's what you wanted to do, fine. But according to the word of God, I don't think God made anybody sin by putting some earrings. He's the one that put the earrings on the bride's ear and gave her jewelry and always talks about like a bride decked out in her finery. Because the only time I could see that a bride finery was removed from her was in cases of adultery. Hello, in cases of adultery where he winds up doing what? Stripping her, okay, of all her finery. And if we stay in Ezekiel 16 and go to verse 39, and I will also give thee unto their hand, and they shall throw down thine eminent place and shall break down thy high places. They shall strip thee also of thy clothes and shall take thy fair jewels and leave thee naked and bare. When a woman who was suspected of being unfaithful in to her husband in Numbers chapter 5, what did he do? He brought her to church and stripped her. Stripped her bare. Now, I'll never forget, there was a conference, okay, in, in Tampa that uh, Eddie Chumney was che uh, teaching about why Yeshua had to die, and he died the death of an adulterous bride. And he said, you know, why did they strip him of his clothes? And then he started going into that. And all of a sudden, I had a major epiphany. Okay, because I was sitting there still very upc duh. Okay. <laughs> all right. And I had a major epiphany that it was a sign of shame. God, who is, is pleased with you, Okay, or a bridegroom that is pleased with his bride decks her out because she is a reflection of his glory. Now, that's even crazy when you consider how he decked out Lucifer. Lucifer was bedecked and he was completely encrusted in gold and jewels. And when the light shone on him, it was, I mean, fantastic. And all I could say, ah, I'm kind of getting this. Lucifer was a type and shadow of a bride, which is why he is so angry at the bride of Messiah because he was stripped of his finery and who was it given to? Us. Given to us. All right, so you got a lot of drama going on. I mean, you talk about a reality show. People ought to read the Bible, okay, behind this. But you have all of these things going on. So you can also understand that why he came to Eve. Eve is who? The bride. He comes against the church because she represents the bride. He comes against everyone that is a reflection of the glory of God. All right, so so much for that. Okay, uh, yeah. All right, so uh, uh, anyway, any questions, okay, about that? So this was very clear, okay, to me once again, why we had to have a born-again experience, why Yeshua had to die the way he did and come back again as one new man, and we come back as one new man. Now we can come together, same God. Okay, that's why if the princes of this world had known what they were doing, they would have never crucified him. Hello. All right. So we have that assurance. Okay. Sometimes yesterday I was thinking I was cracking my own, I crack up at my own jokes sometimes. The kids always say, Ma, you know, you live crazy there. You crack up at your own jokes. 
But I was thinking it was a, a it was a wonderful day as I was running the streets, going back and forth in the car, you know, and everything. And uh, I heard something that ma- really, really made me angry. Okay, I'm trying to deal with some anger lately. Okay, uh, anger issues, and I always remember uh, Yah. Okay, speaking to me through Brother Harris, who was uh, um, Renee's ex pastor. Can God trust you with his thunderbolts? Can God trust you with his thunderbolts? So it was like yesterday I was in the car saying, yes, today, Lord, no, you can't. <laughs> okay, because I'd be throwing them all over the place. Okay, then I heard in my spirit, can I trust you with my thunderbolts? Then I realized they're not mine. I kind of sat back. I'm in the car driving and winking out there. Okay. And then I kind of had an understanding, kind of understanding. Okay. I'm hearing in the spirit. Can you trust me to tell you when to throw my thunderbolts? Okay. So I'm thinking targeted. And I'm hearing, oh, boy, some people better watch out because the day of reckoning is here. All right. So then anyway. I hear the words, words and thunder. I kept hearing words and thunder, voice and thunder. Then I started, when I got home, started looking up those terms, voice and thunder. Okay? Psalm 77, 18. I'll just uh, read it real quick. The voice of thy thunder was in heaven. Psalm 107, 104, verse 7. At thy rebuke, they fled at the voice of thy thunder. They ate it. They hasted away, all right? When I began to look up those terms, there are times when thunder is translated with the same word as voice. Then I had an understanding kind of of what our purpose is because he said, your voice is my thunderbolts. Oh, come on, Holy Ghost, get them. When you speak that word, it is like thunder. When you direct that word, it is like thunder. He said, I will direct your word. Come on, Holy Ghost. You feel that. There's something that you, when you think of the word of God through your mouth is a thunderbolt. And thunderbolts are what? Direct it. When that lightning hits, you see, when that lightning hits a tree, that tree splits. That is how powerful our words are when we are in obedience. You understand what I'm saying? So now I understand the message I was given over 20 years ago from Brother Harris. Can I trust you with my thunderbolts? Can I trust you with my word? Can I trust you to direct that word where I tell you to direct it? Because that word has power behind it. It has power behind it. Now, another word for lightning, which I didn't know, Strong's number H1300, is the word bara. We think of bara as praise, don't we? But that word bara, 1300, was also the name bara that we had, I think, in last week's half Torah portion with Deborah. In fact, he was called the Thunderbolt. That's what they called him, a thunderbolt. Which gives you, okay, a intimation of the power of your praise. When we come together and praise God, it is like the heavens thundering. We're on Mount Sinai, at the foot of Mount Sinai today. And it talks about the thundering, okay, lightning, the thunders and lightning. That word for thunders is actually voice, 
the voices. Okay, voices. Okay, thundering. It's the word coal, Strong's number 6963. All right. And uh, 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 he was just all in my head uh, yesterday. Here's a statement, okay, that I saw. The God of Israel, I'll read it first. The God of Israel is the God of all humankind. Even though the religion of Israel is not the religion of all humankind. I want you to sit back and see La on that for a moment. Who is at the foot of Mount Sinai? This week's Torah portion. We are Israel. Are all the nations there? We are Israel. Why? Because we are chosen out of the nation. To be what to him? A peculiar treasure. You understand what I'm saying? So when you think of that, think of this statement again. And see, is this a true statement? Is the God of Israel the God of all humankind? Yes. Because man was created in his image. So Yahweh, okay, is the God of all humankind. But Mount Sinai... And Torah was given to a specific people called out of the nations. Those that were natural born, and guess what? When you were in, when we were in Egypt, out came natural born and a mixed multitude from other nations that all joined together through the blood of the Lamb to become the entire household of Israel. That mixed multitude was as much of that peculiar treasure as those who were natural born. You understand what I'm saying? So with that statement, yes, okay, the God of Israel is the God of all humankind. Think about the flood. When Noah came out, he was given commandments by who? Those commandments regulated who? All mankind. But Israel is special. We special. Okay, let me tell you something. You know why that's important? Because we aren't like everybody. Okay, how many people don't feel special? You know how when someone gives you special attention, especially when they are an object of love. <laughs> okay, like I got flowers. Thank you so much, Lena and Rich. Okay, the flowers are beautiful. Okay, but when you feel special, when someone treats you special, how do you feel? You puff up, don't you? How much more? When it is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Go to Exodus 19. This is where you put on your Barry White music. Okay. Exodus 19, verse number four. And I, I had to send a lesson over to the kids in Sierra Leone. They want... They want a lesson every Friday, okay? So uh, I sent them over a little lesson. I'm going to ask you guys a favor, if you would do something for me. I would love for you to record a little something, something on your phones and send it to me, okay, about the kids. Say hello or whatever it is, a little message for them so I can send it over to Sierra Leone so that they can know that you guys think about them, okay, also. So if you think about it, can you do that for me? Just, you know, uh, a voice, a little voicemail or something like that on your phone and send it over. I'm quite. Oh, we could do a group one. Okay, yeah, that's a good idea. We could do a, uh, we could do a group one. But even those that are on, on online, yeah, online also. That's why in, we'll do a group one today of the ones that are here. 
but I'd also like something from each of you. And I will send something over every single week so that they know that there are people that are thinking about them. You understand what I'm saying? That's important to a kid, okay, a kid that doesn't have parents, that there are people who are thinking about them and that they're important to them. So I sent them over from uh, a message from both Deuteronomy chapter 7 and then also today's Torah portion, okay, um, Exodus 19 starting at verse 4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to me. Oh, I get chills. Now then, if you will obey me faithfully and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples. Do you see how we are a called out assembly? Which explains why our laws are so different. Remember what Haman said? There is a people whose laws are so different than everyone else. Because we are, yeah, some of us are peculiar, but we are a treasured possession among all the peoples. Indeed, the earth is mine, but you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the children of Israel. How does that make you feel to know that you personally were called out by the creator of the heavens and the earth to be a treasure to him? Stop allow we need to stop allowing ourselves to be measured by what other people think. You understand what I'm saying? Names other people have. You need to go sometimes in the mirror and read that to yourself. Let your eyes see your mouth speaking the words of God directly to you. And that helps build up your confidence in God. You understand what I'm saying with that? That's why it's so important when he tells us to teach our children. Why are our children so downtrodden when their God is the creator of the heavens and the earth who called them out, who had a plan for their life thousands of years before they were even born? You understand what I'm saying? Our children need to know that, but they can't know it about them if we don't know it about ourselves if we don't know it about ourselves. All right, so then, you know, I was going on, okay, and thinking of a, a, a couple of things. Uh, this uh, Torah portion's name is Jethro. Jethro. Jeth uh, think about it. He was a Gentile. He wasn't part of the covenant people, yet there is a Torah portion named after him. There's a Torah portion named after another Gentile also, Balak. Okay, in the book of Numbers, we need to pay attention to that. So Jethro was not part of the covenant people, yet it was Jethro who taught Moses how to organize the leadership of the covenant people. See, God's speaking to me and speaking to us. Sometimes we can listen to people who aren't in Torah. Sometimes we can listen to people who, who don't have any affiliation at all. There is wisdom to be had. And God will choose even a stubborn little donkey if you aren't getting the word or message. I was driving down the uh, street and, uh, you know, I heard, why does sometimes God say things twice in the Bible? Why did he repeat a dream twice? Why did he do those things twice? We know it is once it is done twice, his word is confirmed, right? But it could it also be the reason he said it twice is because you didn't get it the first time. Sometimes someone will say something twice to make sure you understand it. And I was thinking about Pharaoh's dream, the corn and then the cows. It's kind of hard to understand the corn when the corn is eating corn. 
in the natural mind, corn don't eat corn, right? Okay. But when you see the picture of the cows, the fat cows, then the skinny cows eat the fat cows and the skinny cows are still skinny. That kind of picture sticks with you to say, what is this? It causes you to question what God is saying and to do what? Get more clarification from that. That's why sometimes dreams that are repeated, the message is for you because you didn't quite get it the first time. There were certain things you needed to question about a direction that God was going to move you in. Or it could be you ate too many chicken wings before you went to bed. Okay, also, all right, that could be it also. So started thinking about this. Jethro was not part of the covenant people, yet he gave direction and God blesses him. Hagar and Ishmael weren't either. Okay, because sometimes we have a definite us and them attitude, don't we? Come on. Yeah, we do. We do have an us and them. We need to be careful about that. Hagar and Ishmael were not part of the covenant people, yet Yahweh heard their cry, and Yahweh blessed them. He blessed Ishmael, okay, to be what? A great nation. That was in Genesis, I think it was uh, 21. Okay. God heard the prayer of who? The Ninevites. Okay, and did not destroy them because they repented. Let's not think God does not hear the cry of those who are not part of his covenant people. Now, in Zechariah, we learn that all nations will come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Sukkot. Sukkot. And those that do it, Yahweh's going to bless. So understand something. The God of Israel is the God of all mankind. But the religion of Israel is not the religion of all mankind. Keep that thought. Okay? You, not everyone in the end is going to convert to Torah. Not everyone is going to. We see that. Not everyone is going to. But everyone one day will recognize Yahweh as the creator and master of the universe. And I started thinking about that. You can be people of God without being members of Israel. Noah, Eliezer, Jethro, Ishmael, okay? And all of them bless God. Noah blessed God in Genesis 9, 26. Eliezer blessed God in Genesis 24, 27. Jethro blessed Yahweh. Okay, all of them blessed Yahweh in Exodus 18, 10. They all blessed him. They all knew him, even though they weren't part of his covenant people. So what does that tell you? God is universal. Yahweh is universal. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. We got to get this straight, because if you don't, where purpose is unknown, abuse is inevitable. We have to know who we are, but what God's purpose for us is in relationship to the rest of the world, okay? Because we have and have been given a very specific function today. We were to be a nation of what? Priest, okay? To who? The rest of the world, okay? Is everyone in Israel a priest? We were to be a nation of priests. So all humanity was created in his image. However, we are a called out people to be particular and to have a special relationship. We're not only a special people, but we have a special relationship with the creator that no other people or other nations have. America is one nation under God, right? But America is not Israel. So that's kind of hard. I, I can feel evangelicals levitating right now. Heads rotating. Sorry. America is a nation under God. But America is not 
is all right let's see um we have what mount sinai and the covenant revelation given at sinai were not given to everyone understand that they were not given to everyone because we think everyone is doing this and everyone's supposed to do that no those laws weren't given to everyone they were given to a called out assembly if they were given to everyone why did God move them out of Egypt? He could have just done this thing while everyone was in Egypt. You understand? All right. It was given to a specific people based upon a relationship he desired to have with us. Is that kind of hard for you to wrap your mind around? That God wants to have a relationship personally with you, with each of us. All right. We're supposed to live. Now, listen, here's the key. We are special, but we're also human. We're supposed to live in such a way that it will cause the nations to want to know him in a special way. Let me tell you something. With things that are going on today, a lot of people don't want to have anything to do with the God that we say is our God because of what? The behavior that they see people who supposedly worship that God exhibit. You think there are going to be repercussions for that? Yes, because we vilified his name. We're supposed to live our life in such a way that everyone will desire to know him the way that we do. Just something to see lot on. In the end, all are going to come to know him, but only Israel and those who join with Israel will be special to him. Then I went, okay, and I looked up on the uh, uh, Blue Letter Bible, the terms, no, I am the Lord. No, I am the Lord. And it's no that I am the Lord. It was very insightful. Because the first one, okay, in, uh, um, that I have here, Exodus 6, verse 7. I'm going to read it. I have this up already, so you don't have to turn to it. Exodus 6, 7. Just write them down. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and ye shall know, you shall know that I am Yahweh, your Elohim, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of Egypt, of the Egyptians. He said that to us while we were still in Egypt. Glory. Exodus 7, 5, we're still in Egypt. <laughs> and the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. What I was looking for is how are all nations and under what conditions are the other nations going to know that he is Yahweh? Okay, Exodus 7, 17, thus saith Yahweh, in this you shall know that I am Yahweh. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in my hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. He was talking to Pharaoh. That don't sound so good. Okay. So, so far I'm seeing love language to us, judgment upon the nations. Okay, Exodus 8, verse 22. I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there to the end that you will know that I am Yahweh in the midst of the earth. So understand something. He is defining us as a special people in a special relationship to him by doing what? Separating us from the plagues that are going on in that nation. So that people will be looking at you and saying, how come you aren't going through all this financial hardship? How come you aren't experienced such and such? You understand what I'm saying? Because there is a time in the midst of the plagues 
that he separates his people so that there will be a clear delineation between those who serve the one true God and do what? Have the keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua Hamashiach. Not one or the other, but both. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, then he goes on here. Okay, Exodus 9, verse 29. Moses said to him, as soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto Yahweh, and the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more hail, that you may know how that the earth is Yahweh's. Hallelujah. Exodus 10, 2. And that you may tell, now this is important, and that you may tell in the ears of your son and your son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them that you may know how that I am Yahweh. So we're supposed to use this example to teach our children the power of the God that we want them to have a special relationship with. See, if they have nothing to relate to, let me say something to you. This may, may make a couple people mad. Their first experience with God is as a, help, a helpless baby. Their next big experience is a man on the cross. They don't see him as the God who brought you out of Egypt with mighty signs and wonders. You understand what I'm saying? There is a psychological, when you look, that's why I tell people, get them crosses with that. There is, there is power in the blood, yes, but he is risen. Get him off the cross. He's no longer on the cross. You understand what I'm saying? Because there is a psychological thing when you keep looking at him being defeated in death, even though we know it was a victory. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Exodus 14, 4. I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them, and I, I will be honored upon Pharaoh and all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am Yahweh. So the Egyptians had to know that Yahweh was more powerful than Pharaoh. And the only way he could do that was by bringing down Pharaoh in the sight of the Egyptians and the entire world. Exodus 14, 18, and the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. Okay? Exodus 16, we're out of Egypt. Yay! I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Okay? Important for you to delineate this yourself. While you were in Egypt, Pharaoh was giving you your bread and all that. Even though towards the end of the, in the plagues, Yahweh did what? Put a separation between you. But there, oh, come on. There is one thing with Yahweh taking care of you when you're in Egypt. There's another thing stepping out in faith and coming into the wilderness. We had to learn that Yahweh was a provider for us even in the wilderness. You understand what I'm saying? He didn't call us out into the wilderness for us to starve to death. He called us out to show us I can provide for you. That your provision is not based upon the whim of a man, but upon my word, my plan for you. 
You understand what I'm saying? Hmm. Exodus 29, 46, and they shall know that I am Yahweh, their Elohim, that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. Why? That I may dwell upon them. I am Yahweh, their Elohim. He wasn't going to dwell in the midst of us in Egypt. Why? Because Egypt had its set of gods, and to everyone else, Yahweh would have just been another god. You understand what I'm saying? He brought us out so that he could dwell in the midst of us and be our only God. How powerful is it that the God who wants to dwell, okay, in you, within you, is also the one that is the creator of the heavens and the earth. When you understand that, then you understand if there is something that he called you to do that doesn't exist, stop looking at man because the one who told you to do it is the one who will create it for you. Come on. Sometimes our faith, we're in, out of Egypt, but we're still looking to Egypt for provision. We're waiting for Egypt to send Amazon, okay, out to us in the wilderness, okay? I need such and such. Call Uber Eats. Here comes the chicken sandwich, okay? Manna tasted like bi biscuits. Manna was like honey biscuits and then the quail, like chicken. So what did he bring him? Church's chicken sandwich, okay? Is it called the heavenly Uber Eats? Okay, and brought them meat in the wilderness. My God is awesome. Okay, <laughs> it might not even have been time, but the quail didn't know what hit them. All they knew is snap, crackle, and pop in the pan. Okay, why? Because I wanted a chicken sandwich in the wilderness. God can provide. And that's how we know he is Yahweh when he provides for us things that man can't. Made no common sense. Good Lord. Okay, Exodus 31, 13. Speak thou also to the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am Yahweh that sanctifies you. So we need to understand that Yahweh sanctifies us and has given us a sign that will carry through unchanged throughout our generations. And that's the Sabbath. Sabbath was not changed by God. Sabbath was changed by man. You understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to figure out how the church calls church fathers, like Irenaeus and all of them, that were born hundreds of years after the church was found. How's the father going to, how the son going to be here, the kids going to be here before the daddy? already grown up that doesn't make sense you understand what i'm saying it does not make my mind does not compute that okay at all so we need to know that he is yahweh who sanctifies us and gave us the sabbath you understand yahweh gave us the sabbath man does not tell us when the sabbath is yahweh gave us the sabbath as a sign to sanctify us set apart. We were sanctified eating them hams, shrimp, sanctified, saved and sa Come on now, come on. Altar call right now. All right, Leviticus 23.43, that your generations may know, that's Leviticus 23.43, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt 
I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Another generational thing we're supposed to be teaching that they will know that he is Yahweh. Okay? Deuteronomy 29, 6. You have not eaten bread, neither have you drunk wine or strong drink, that ye might know that I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Okay, now, things can start getting rough. Everybody's all warm and fuzzy right now because, you know, we're feeling good. We're, you know, all in obedience. Deuteronomy 13, 20, 31. I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 31, 27. For I know your rebellion <laughs> and your stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, you have been rebellious against Yahweh. How much more after my death? So things can start getting rough when you say you know Yahweh and make a conscious choice to do what? Disobey Yahweh. All right, let's put it this way, guys. Okay. We can know Yahweh on either side of his mercy or his judgment. When we look at, uh, and we were talking about how, I'll say non-Israelites, even though we don't think of uh, Ahab as an Israelite, do we? But he was. Okay, First Kings 20, 13. And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus says Yahweh, thou hast seen all this great multitude. Behold, I will deliver it into thy hand this day, and you shall know that I am Yahweh. Have you ever faced an enemy that was more strong than you, and you didn't know how you were going to get out of it, and all of a sudden you got deliverance? That was so that you could know he is Yahweh. Ahab was not obedient. Yet Ahab was still an Israelite. And God had made a promise to who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let me tell you something. When God has a plan for your life, you honestly think something walking in two legs is going to mess it up? You can choose not to do it. But when God has a plan for your life, and you are determined to go with that plan, he will move heaven and earth for you to do it. All right. Um, Isaiah 49, 10. You are my witnesses, saith Yahweh, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe in me and understand that I am am he you remember yeshua saying that and what their reaction to him was before me there was no god form neither shall there be after me you know why that's a big problem for some people because we want to you want to know why the jews have a problem with with yeshua because of this verse right here one reason if you're calling him God, then you believe in more than one God. And you believe that the Holy Spirit is a God. You have this trinity that is three gods. You understand what I'm saying? And that's a violation of Torah. So he very clearly says in that verse, you are my witnesses, saith Yahweh. Did not Yeshua say that? And my servant, we're disciples whom I have chosen that you may know and believe in me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God form, neither shall there be after me. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. You wanted to know what I look like? Here I am, the Aleph Tav. All right? Isaiah 45, 6, and I'm, I'm just about finished. That they may know, Isaiah 45, 6, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am Yahweh and there is none else. Okay, 
Then I have a couple of uh, um, uh, verses that I started getting into. And let me see. All right. Ezekiel chapter 25, verse 7. Because remember how we said, we first started that God, the God of Israel is the God of all humanity. All right. And all are going to come to know him. So far, we've seen the Gentile nations come to know him through his judgments. How are the nations going to come to know him and then come to the Feast of Tabernacles, okay, to worship him as the king? Ezekiel, what did I say? 25, verse 7. Oh, hold on here. Oh, next page, next page. Okay, Ezekiel 25, 7. Behold, therefore, I stretch out my hand upon thee and will deliver thee for a spoil to the heathen, and I will cut thee off from people, and I will cause thee to perish out of the countries. I will destroy thee, and you shall know that I am Yahweh. That was to the Ammonites. So the Ammonites shall know he is Yahweh. Ezekiel 25, 11. I will execute judgments upon Moab, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. So it looks like the way that the Gentile nations are going to know him is not from their mercy, because he's already been merciful. That didn't seem to work. There comes a time when mercy ends and judgment begins. Okay, Exodus 25, 17, and I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am Yahweh when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. Ezekiel 26, 6. This is for Tyre. And her daughters which are in the field shall be slain by the sword, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. So let me, oh, let's go another one. Uh, Ezekiel 28, 22. And say, thus saith Adonai Yahweh, behold, I am against thee, Sidon, and I will be glorified in the midst of thee, and they shall know that I am Yahweh when I have executed judgments in her and shall be sanctified in her. So it looks like to me in the end times, the end of days, how Yahweh is going to get the nations to turn to him is through what? Judgments. On an international level, the plague, the four sword judgments, the plague, the sword, the wild beast, okay, and famine. Can you say we have all of that going on right now in this nation? Yes, we do. And that's important to know because he begins to talk about Israel. For I will, uh, Ezekiel 28, 23. For I will send unto her pestilence and blood into her streets. And the wounded shall be judged in the midst of her by the sword upon her on every side, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. So even if Israel forgets, God gives mercy, and at a point in time, there is a time when the scales of justice must be balanced. The scales of justice on one side is mercy, the other side is judgment. For the, if he gives mercy, okay, when judgment comes, it looks like there is no mercy. But the judgments are actually God's mercy. Because just like he did in the garden, he kicked them out of the garden and forbid them to eat the tree of life in their fallen state. That was an act of mercy that looked like judgment. So we see all of these things happening.